start over. <laughs> Welcome to Rock Gods and Messy Monsters Ravel Launch Event. I'm here with author Diane Hatz. Here's the book. So Diane is a writer, author, interactivist. She comes to the writer's room all the time, which I'm delighted to say. And her fictional novel, Rock Gods and Messy Monsters, has recently been released and is available at online retailers. We're going to put in links at the end of this. And she also publishes uh, on Substack, which is called Next Draft with Diane Hatz. And for creatives teaching inward, she's currently writing articles about the symbolism and meaning behind the scenes and characters in her book, as well as information on indie publishing and promotion. So Diane, why don't you sure um, why don't you share with us a short excerpt from your book? And then we'll jump into an interview afterwards. Okay. The rest of the way it's gonna go is, Diane's gonna read, I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open it up for Q&A with the audience. And then we'll just do a general chat after that. So Diane, you wanna start? Great. Okay, Stacy, you are number one that I see in the audience, so. There are three excerpts I have, and I couldn't decide. So pick either clock, brain, or lawyer. Just the first thing that comes to your head. Clock. I'm glad you picked that one. Okay. So DiMaggio is the president of the record company. Um, Alex is the main character. She's not in this ex excerpt. It's letting you see what the heads of record companies are like. DiMaggio felt the steam rising within him. I'm on my way. He continued staring up Broadway while his body churned with frustration and executive impatience. He tilted his head as he tried to read the digital display board atop the Mutual of New York building. Hundreds of light bulbs flashed the current temperature and time to anyone who looked up in its direction. He glanced at his watch, 123. He looked back out the window and was almost positive the clock read 119. He glanced at his watch again, then back out into the city. DiMaggio turned around and hit his intercom button. Yes, came through the speaker. Get in here now. His twin Swedish assistants, the Doubleman Girls of Rock, came rushing through the door, pen and paper in hand. DiMaggio pointed to a spot next to him. Over here. His assistants immediately obliged. There, said DiMaggio as he pointed toward the window. Hosanna and Hosanna looked out at the city of concrete, metal, and glass spread out before them. Do you see it? The Doubleman Girls of Rock glanced quickly at each other. Jesus, how dumb are you two? Look at the clock. His assistants did as they were told. Steam spilled from DiMaggio's ears. Damn it, can't you see? It's four minutes slow. It's been four minutes slow for weeks. And look at all those burned out light bulbs. How can anyone even read the time? The women looked at each other again, confusion written all over their faces. You're certainly right, said Hazana. I know I'm right, damn it. The deity turned and glared at his assistants. It's driving me crazy. Get it fixed. Excuse me, said Hosanna. DiMaggio raised his voice even louder and spoke with exaggerated slowness. Get the clock fixed. Get the burned out bulbs replaced. I want to see the correct time on that clock tomorrow morning. DiMaggio stormed past his open mouth assistants and took the executive eleva elevator up two floors to the Akadad Training and Development Laboratory in 38. So that's it. And it really happened, just so you know. And I am the one, and I got the clock fixed. <laughs> that's great. So do you have an excerpt which has Alex in it? I do. Why don't you read that one next? Okay, so Alex is the main character. Just slow down just a little bit. I know, it's hard. You get nervous. Alex is the main character. The book starts where she realizes she has to get out of her job. So um, this is excerpt is when she has just come back from another interview where the position was already filled before she got there. And Helly is the receptionist. Helly put down her pencil and turned off the music. What's wrong? The usual, said Alex, pulling out another piece of candy from her pocket. I just went to an interview and was told the job was already filled. She bit the mini chocolate bar in half. Through her chewing, she said, I'm so tired of all this. I'm sorry, said Helly, 
as she quietly dipped her hand into her aquarium and gently caressed her mutant sea creatures. As Alex looked at Helly's desk, something seemed wrong. Something definitely seemed missing. Alex gasped. Oh my God, she said with genuine shock as she took a small step back and stared at Helly. Your cerebrum urn is missing. What did you do? Helly replied nonchalantly. I told the cerebrum security patrol I was getting migraines from the fluorescent lights. So I asked for a smoked black urn, sort of sunglasses for my brain. Alex completely forgot about her interview. And they're letting you keep your brain in until it arrives? Helly shrugged her shoulders. Yes, but the urn came yesterday. Alex's eyes widened. Where is it? In my drawer. Helly grinned mischievously. Want to see something even better? Alex nodded, unable to believe Helly's blatant disregard for the rules. She shoved the rest of the candy in her mouth and licked the melting chocolate off her fingers. Helly looked around, making sure no one was in the immediate vicinity. She motioned for Alex to come to her side of the desk. Helly pulled open the bottom drawer and pulled out a package wrapped in brown paper. Behind the package was her sparkling new urn, complete with fresh, semi-pasteurized brain nutrient juice. She picked up the urn and placed it on the floor between her feet. Helly then carefully untied the string from the wrapped package, saving it for possible later use, and removed the paper. Alex put her hand to her mouth and gasped again. There, inside the paper, resting on Helly's lap, was a brain. It's rubber, said Helly matter-of-factly as she picked up the cerebrum and dropped it into her new urn. She carefully lifted the black-tinted container and placed it on her desk in the proper cerebrum place. Alex was stunned. How on earth? Gift store. What? exclaimed Alex. Helly's grin broke into a large smile. The card and gift store just down the block. Alex was reeling. But why would they have brains? Helly shrugged. Guess I'm not the first to come up with the idea. But aren't you afraid? Helly smiled. Of what? Of them firing me? So what? That's all they can do. But doesn't that scare you? Of course not. I can always find work somewhere. Alex looked at Helly. I don't understand you. I put up with this because I want to work in music. And I know Langley would never give me a good reference if I quit. So I put up with all this. But if you're sure you could get another job, why do you stay here? Helly shrugged matter-of-factly. This pays more than working in a hamburger joint, so I'm content to sit here for a few years while I work toward getting what I really want. And because this is part of the journey toward my goal, it's okay. It doesn't bother me. It's simply part of the process. Alex was confused. What in the world are you talking about? Helly smiled. The fun isn't the goal. The fun is everything you do to get to that goal. Alex rolled her eyes in exasperation. The end, part two. (laughs) <laughs> so for those of you who know nothing about the book alex all the lower level um employees have to unzip their head and pull their brain out and put it on an urn on their desk every day because they're not allowed to think only the executives are allowed to think symbolic of reality of a reality i lived i mean i i really enjoyed that part of because it's so imaginative and it was it almost felt like these metaphors come to life in an exaggerated way that just felt so true. Thank you. It reminded me of the book um, Temporary by Hilary Leiter, which is a really excellent book as well. Um, but why don't you tell us now more about Rock Guts? How would you describe the plot or wh- how would you describe it in general? So... Rock Gods and Messy Monsters is one woman's search for self inside a crazy, insane record company in the 1990s. I mean, that's the very short. It's absurdist. It's surreal. It's humor. My goal with writing is I hope that I can write on a pure entertainment level. So if someone is just like, I've had a bad day, I just want to read a funny book. They can just read a funny book. But then there's a secondary level where there's a message and that is her search for self everything in the book that is surreal and seems crazy means something. So for example, aliens by the record company. And I chose aliens because in the nineties, foreign corporations were buying us record labels and I was brought up on rock and roll and it meant so much. And I'm like, no, they're selling out. Um, And I worked at Sony and the Japanese had bought CBS records to implement the mini disc. And the book is sort of based around that. Is that a long-winded answer, Kit? <laughs> no, no, no. So that was really your inspiration for Rock Gods and Messy Monsters was your work? 
Would you say my, that? My inspiration was the fact that I had a boss who, um, I shouldn't say he's Langley, but I, I had a series of bosses who would had anger issues. And back then before me too, and all that, um, he would call me in and make me shut the door and he would pound the desk and scream at me. And this is like almost daily. And I did it. The fact that I walked into his office day after day and allowed him to treat me that way is the issue. It's not what he did to me. It's that I allowed that to happen to me. And that's sort of the point of the book. That's interesting. Because there were so many unique characters in it and different bad bosses in different ways. I wish I wish everybody had read the book because I think this would make a great book group type of book because you could talk about the, the different characters and, and try to figure out what they mean. You know, what does Weena mean? And she's, these things are happening to her. I just, because um, Langley was, the angry boss was, was really kind of very vivid. Right. Well, Weena, so you guys, Weena was the head of publicity and she has anxiety issues and her body parts fall off. So she glues her body parts back on. So part of that was someone telling me that Michael Jackson's nose really did fall off in the end because he had so many operations. So I sort of took that. And then there was somebody who I knew who worked in media relations, who was very anxious. So I just had her body parts fall off. So there is, and there's probably some psychological stuff that I don't even know, you know, some subliminal, whatever that I put in there, but the book was a way for me to survive the insanity I put myself through. And I don't blame any of the people around me. And, and I don't, I shouldn't say blame. I stayed there. And that's sort of the point of the book that each of us has to take action if we're unhappy with where we are and that we can complain and we can be unhappy and we can be whatever, but unless we stand up for her ourselves, odds are nothing's going to change. We're just going to repeat over and over again, the same situation. So I'm thinking about opening lines. And when I read yours, the blood didn't bother Alex, but cleaning, cleaning it up made her angry. That's a powerful opening line. Thank you. That took four and a half years. <laughs> no, it's funny. It um, I was just on a panel in Las Vegas and we, that came up opening lines. And I was with two other indie authors. We were talking about how so many people open a book and read the first line and it can make or break a book. In truth, the line sang to me. I think there's a lot in there that even I didn't unpack when I wrote it. It just felt right. So it was she doesn't mind hard work, but she minded the, the uh, subservient horrible things she had to do. I don't know, Kit, you could probably unpack it better than I could. You could get a psychologist <laughs> in. Um, but I do think it sets the book up really well because in the first scene, Alex is realizing she has to get out because her, her boss would be so angry. And one day I just visualized that my boss at the time just exploded blood vessels because he was purple and he'd have this vein that would bulge. And I just took it one step further in my mind. Um, and I didn't have to sew up his neck, but exploded that her job was to sew up his neck when he had explosions. So. So this book just came out earlier this month and I know that you indie published it. So why did you go indie and not through a traditional publisher? I could say very shortly because I worked in the corporate music industry and I know <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> so I know there are people in our group and I should back up and say this book was actually written in the 90s and I self-published in 2008 when people were just starting to, and I say self-published back then, I just threw it on Amazon, didn't promote it. I had to prove to myself that I wrote a book. I didn't promote it. I didn't know what to do. I had such horrific low self-esteem. Um, so this spring, a friend contacted me and she had found the book and she said she just read it. She shut the book and she quit her job. And she, her, she's actually the person, her name's Cree. She's the person who designed the book cover. She's quit her job. She was in telecom law and she's one of the most creative people I've ever known. She designed the cover. She's designed these banners behind me, but she's a experiential event designer. 
So she's now pursuing her dream. I had another friend just email and she said, I just bought a desk. I am definitely going to write now. You, your book inspired me so much. Um, and kid, I just went off on a tangent. Oh, why did I indie publish? So I, sorry, that was a total different answer to another question that was in my head though. And I had to get it out. So indie publishing, it takes so long. So when I first did the book, I sent out so many um, queries and I got so many rejections. And I think, hmm, I don't want to say who it was, but there was one company, I mean, not getting anything is bad, but when you get a form rejection with boxes and the box tick said, get another career. I mean, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was just so traumatized. I just gave up. So um, when my friend has convinced me to put this out again and to market it properly. Cause she, she said, and I did, I thought this was about the music industry. She said, no, this is about search for self. This is about knowing that your dreams can be an illusion or a delusion. Um, and it's still very relevant today. So I chose to indie publish because I think that's where things are going. I'm also a bit of a punk DIY. Um, I think that this is the new frontier. Traditional publishing has so many problems. You're going to wait. It's also, I have some control issues. Um, you send out to agents. So that might take a year or two. You get an agent. The agent is going to want you to change stuff. Then you get the agent finds a publisher. That could be another year or two. And that publisher wants you to change stuff. So you have to, you have to be okay with changing. And then the publishing company designs your book cover. They decide most of your marketing and then they throw everything back on you anyway. And from what I understand, a lot of writers today, A, are getting dropped and B, you're stuck with all the marketing anyway. So why get like a buck, a book royalty when you can get six or seven times that amount and publish yourself? It's a very long answer. Well, I'm just, I mean, I think a lot of us are interested in this subject, but you talked about self-publishing versus indie publishing. How yeah, oh, yeah. I do see those as different. So you want okay. to that? Yes. No one self-publishes anymore, folks. Self-publish was a term that traditional publishers coined back in the 2000s when it started happening because there were a lot of vanity presses and it was looked down upon. I ran an indie label for a while. I work with indie bands. I don't know why it's taken so long for the publishing industry to understand that we're independent. We're independent writers. We're independent creators. We're independent artists. We're not doing this ourselves. You hire an editor, you, you know, you might hire a marketer. You're using all these outside. So it's, it's independent of corporate control, but it's not on your own. So I'm really, it's a real like sticking point with me to say indie publish, indie book. I'm an indie author, no self. So it sounds like you're an evangelist for indie publishing, which yes. is great. So, you know, do you want to talk a little bit like what was the experience like? It seems like sure. in whether you would recommend it, who you would recommend it for. Um, okay. I would say I did everything wrong. I cried more tears. I just, it's still not on bookshop.org. Two days ago, Ingram Spark just approved the manuscript. So I will say flat out, if you're looking to, to publish yourself, you have to think about what you want. I want a career from this. I don't believe I can get it with a, tradi a traditional publisher unless I become successful and they come to me with a million dollar or whatever advance. I would consider if they're going to give me a huge hunk of money, I'll sell out. I'm 60. I'll sell out. Um, with there would be requirements though. I'd have to keep certain control, but I, I would say flat out, if you're publishing, if you want to publish yourself, publish to Amazon. I'm not an Amazon fan. I tried to avoid them. You get 60% royalty and it's easy to do. Then you go to Ingram Spark, which distributes everywhere else, and it will skip Amazon. So those are the two places. If you do that, you will not cry many of the tears I cried. Um, the thing, once you have that, okay, this is after you have a good book cover. The three things you need are a good story, a good book cover, and a good editor. Those are the three things that you need. You're going to need that with a traditional publisher or on your own. I personally think everybody should go indie. I think it's going to become easier. There's people like me 
my next book, I'm putting my fiction book on hold because I'm writing a guide to indie publishing because I've learned so much and I do not want anyone else to go through what I went through. Um, unless, unless you're going to get a heck of a lot of money up front. When I, and I can only equate this to my music business days. And even in the nineties, bands needed to look at their advance as all the money they were going to make because I sat in meetings and listen to executives discuss how to rip off artists and how to take more money from them and how not to make to make sure they never got a royalty after their advance. So I know this happens because I witnessed, you know, I was there and heard it. So I can't believe publishing is much different. Um, so I would say if you want to make money in a career, at least start indie, because if you develop a following and you can make some money at it, a bigger person will come and then offer you a decent advance. If you don't care about royalties, if you just want to feel like if you're old school and you're like, oh, I just want to say I'm at Simon and Schuster or whoever, then do it, you know, just have patience. And look, you know, everyone, every time you read like book bub, no one ever gets book bub is a way to promote. No. And like I applied and I got it. So you could on your first shot, get into a major publisher. It happens. Don't listen to anyone else. That would probably be my underlying thing is you got to sit with yourself. Each person has to decide what they want and then they have to go for it. Don't listen to other people. I listened to too many YouTube videos and too many articles from people who were just wrong. And that's the other thing I really want to stress is there's a lot of misinformation online about indie publishing. There are some good people. So in this, got this book I'm going to write, I'm going to say who I found are good people to sort of learn from and listen to because a lot of people are YouTube influencers on how to publish and like some of the stuff's wrong. So I don't know if that answers your question. Like, okay, let me, let me sum that all up. I can't answer who should be published and who shouldn't. I think everyone should. Each person should, should, should weigh the pros and cons. How quickly do they want to get published? How much effort do they want to put into the book? And then from that, make the decision. And also, I want to throw in, uh, I saw Karen saying she wants to know which publisher. It's not fair. I don't know if they're around anymore. Um, and I'm sure this was in the 2000s. They probably didn't do that anymore. And they might have gone out of business. They're not, they're not a big five. They're a cool, trendy, we think we're hip because the founder thinks he's hip company. So I guess, uh, yeah, the question, Ingram Sparks was, is the name of the, of the so Ingram, Ingram Spark is the company that when you go through a traditional publisher, that's the company that distributes out to all the libraries um, and all the other places. That's how it gets into physical bookstores, like a Barnes and Noble physically. So if you publish on Ingram Spark, if you give up a lot of royalty, you can potentially have someone put you in their physical bookstore. If you push yourself enough, like usually a local bookstore will be open to it. So it's Amazon KDP for paperback. I did Kindle for the first 90 days, Ingram Spark for the rest paperback everywhere else. And then I'm going to do what's called draft to digital um, for the ebook. And I'm going to put it up manually on Kobo, which is Canada, Apple Books and Google. And I think they're the three. Anyway, this is all going to be in my book. <laughs> well, we can't wait that long. So now, regardless of how it gets published, promotion is yeah. is a part of is is the next thing that you need to do. So, do you want to tell us a little bit how you've been promoting your book? And so, as I said, I just started yesterday officially. Um, everything I read, they said book bub is can can make superstars. I got accepted for. It's called New Releases for Less. This is not the featured deal. Featured deal on BookBub is what you can sell thousands. BookBub is only, anyway, I'm going to get people confusing. So I think it's very important one, do promo tour. So I found this company called Goddess, Goddess Fish Promotions. I hate that name. The blogs that I'm writing for are like on Blogger. They're like, I, I just am not used to this. It's like the nineties. Actually, it fits perfectly with the book if I think about it, but I'm doing an eight week virtual blog tour where once or twice a week I'm writing into um, original pieces that are going up on their blogs along with an excerpt. So 
yesterday was my first one on Gina Ray Mitchell's blog. And I got 13 followers on Goodreads from it, which that is worth it for me because I had none. Okay. And Goodreads is, is Amazon owned. Anyone who writes has to be on Goodreads. So the thing is, and this is what's difficult is I'm still in it. So I can't give you, but one, you should do a virtual book tour. Two, you should, you should get some ed reviews if you can afford it. One thing I do suggest is like every week, even if it's five bucks, put some money away, just put it in a piggy bank. You can't, you'll crack open when you're ready to promote. If you can't, I'm really fortunate. I was looking at starting a business and I didn't have tons of money, but I'm, I'm able, I have a marketing budget and I have a promotion budget. You should build one as you're writing your book because it costs money. I, I fortunately did a Kirkus review and Kirkus review is the gold standard of reviews. You should definitely go for one of them, but they're $625 now. I wouldn't do it. I'm using mine from 2008. I did Midwest book review, independent book review. I think they're supposed to be good. And I got some really good reviews. So you need a couple editorial reviews because on your Amazon page, it looks good. So you need to get a couple of reviews. You need to do a blog tour, podcasts. I had been told about this company called Pod Match, which I've signed up for. It's 30 bucks a month. I don't know if I'm going to recommend it now because I just Googled, you know, podcasts for new writers and all these things came up. So I'm doing it one-on-one. So we'll see. Um, but you should, you should do interviews. I think what's really important is look at what your book is about and find ideas from there. So mine's based at a record company. So I haven't yet, but I'm going to be researching record companies. I'm getting comped a ticket to the who in Denver in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to research record stores and then go around. I have um, bookmarks and postcards and see if they'll put them out. And then I'll give them a copy of the book and see if they might be willing to sell it. Or even if they just promote it to people that come in. So it's thinking of like, you know, if, if your book takes place in Savannah, Georgia, contact places in Savannah, Georgia and see if they would sell it or the chamber of commerce. I mean, you never know. I have all that left to do. Yeah. Have I confused everyone? I know, I'm sorry. This is very hard and it's a lot and it's extremely overwhelming. I'm fortunate I'm taking a couple years off. I'm doing this full time. If you are working or you have a family, take whatever time you think it's gonna take. If you're working full time, triple it and just be patient. The other thing that's really important to stress, books don't die. Like 20 years ago, your book came out from a traditional publisher. It went into Barnes and Noble for three months maybe, and then it's thrown away. It's just remaindered and that's it. Now everything's evergreen. It stays online. You can sell it forever. It doesn't get old. You know, if you feel like it's getting old, you just get a new book cover and you get a new ISBN and you can just republish it. And that's what people do. It's a completely different game now. And it's exciting. I can't wait till you get till you and Talani. I can't wait till Talani gets her book done. And you guys like are doing this because this is really exciting. It is. Well, I shared into the chat, I put in a link to your Substack, which is like your blog. So if people want to sign up and follow you there. And I also put in a link to rock odds and messy monsters.com. Thank and you. And now if other people want to get in touch with you, is there another way that they should do that? If they're on Revel, you can just email me through there. I mean, I'm on there. Otherwise, I have rock.gods at yahoo.com because I thought a Yahoo account is perfect for a 1990s based book. Um, I also see Nancy asks, is Amazon KDP the same as simply selling on Amazon? So Amazon KDP is Amazon's book publishing company they do ebook and print so you can publish anywhere and have it sold on amazon so i started at a place called lulu the thing is is that i published through lulu and what i didn't know is the day i started everything on lulu was the publication date on amazon and then when i try to make a change it wouldn't take on Amazon. So like my whole thing is go directly to Amazon because you can get into a um, a dashboard and update. Like when you get a review in, an editorial review where you want to update your bio, you can do that easily. So any print on demand company will sell to Amazon. I think it's best to publish your book through Amazon and then use Ingram for everywhere else. I hope that makes sense. 
right now, why don't we open it up for questions since it seems people are, are dying to ask you things. And I'm going to remove the spotlight and allow everybody else to, so we can see everybody. Laurel. Laurel. Oh, who has her hand up? Yeah, do you want to unmute? Yes, thank you. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I think the point of the whole book is is the passion, which is, you know, what fuels a, what seems a delusional dream, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's what's paving the way. I mean, you know, the, the industry was entrepreneurial and then it became corporate. Yes. But, you know, the people who have the true passion for music are natural entrepreneurs. Yes. And just look, you've taken all your skills and, you know, you're, this is like a microcosm of the whole music industry and particularly women's role. I mean, remember when there were hardly any women and if there were, there were, they were somebody's secretary and then gradually they let women be in the publicity departments, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the whole uh, story, you know, I, and I just wanted to say that I don't really see how low self-esteem uh, can coexist with putting a book out there. So I just think your journey is fascinating and all these things that are acquired along the way, you know, like that with the one woman that you were talking about in the beginning, who the mischievous one, you know, she, um, you know, what you, you had to question was the point of what she was doing that it's about the, the journey, not the destination, or did she, I mean, I was wondering if she actually had a true passion for the music industry. So I, I wish you would answer that question and thank you for uh, listening to my comments. I quite enjoyed every word. Thank you. I don't know if I should answer it. I, I mean, I don't know if you're going to read the book, but that scene sets up sh who she is in the end. So at the very and end, she, of the she's a character though right she's sorry the one who had the brain in the desk yeah heli yeah yes yeah, so heli heli is an entrepreneur but you're going to have to read the book to find out oh okay okay so yes heli, <laughs> heli does symbolize something and the other thing that's really important for just the music part of this i'm not mocking people and the art there are some no not people. at all on the contrary right the artists were always great what pissed me off were these I'm sorry, white men who sat in corner offices who never even listened to the radio growing up because they didn't even know who Elton John was, who are dictating right? these lives of these young, creative, amazing musicians and bands. And that used to right. tip me off. They were, they were uh, presuming to call the shots, the suits, right? The yes. Suits. Yes. So <laughs> this is a total aside. I did all sampling clearances for Sony Music in the 90s because nobody thought sampling was ever going to become anything so if it was an indie band and they were cool i charge them charge them five bucks if it was another like major label i charge like fifty thousand. they ended up with like that 10. is amazing so yeah. you were a pioneer in that that's pretty amazing oh like when i left like 10 lawyers took over that they they just didn't get it anyway i don't want to go <laughs> off on that i wish them all well wherever no, they well, are thank, thank you for painting more of the picture thank you so much Thank you, Laura. Yeah. The other thing we were going to do was Diane has graciously offered to to give a lucky winner a copy of a signed copy of her book. So, Diane, why don't you choose a number between one and fifteen, and we'll randomly assign it to somebody. Twelve. Twelve. Okay. Our scientifically based. Sharon in Hudson Valley, New York, you are a winner. Thank you. Thank you. So Sharon, can you do me a favor? Can you just private, can you get on the chat? If not, can you email me on Revel? Just send me your mailing address so I can send it to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you want to, Mary has her hand up. Okay. No, I apologize. I'm driving at the moment. I can't, <laughs> I, I can't wait. I, I I ordered the the book and Amazon told me, oh, it couldn't. It's not in yet. It's not gonna. Oh wait, then, Mary, Mary. Yeah. If you, okay, if that was a couple of days ago, because because Amazon agreed to put a widget on that page because that was one of my issues with Lulu, and it's too complicated to go into. But there are two listings on Amazon, and one is dead. So what you were on. You probably got there before 
there's a thing you click now if you go on the wrong page it sends you to the right page so the book is 1495 if you click into that one you you can definitely order it awesome thank you yeah yeah oh no that's a chapter eileen eileen i'm very excited you got the book so am I, and I'm enjoying it. And, uh, you know, I was going to bring up the first line, but Kit beat me to it. Um, in the meantime, I really am um, curious. You personally know the brilliant artist who designed yes. this. So what do you recommend the rest of us do if we don't happen to have a brilliant, talented friend? Where do you go looking? for a cover artist. So I'm hoping she's going to do it for me forever because I know it's difficult. Um, I, I am not a fan of Fiverr, which is what some people do. So there's, have you heard of Readsy? Readsy has a blog. They have a marketplace and they yes. have editors and book designers. That's, I, I can't put like a gold stamp of approval on them, but that's supposed to be pretty good. And because it's through Readsy, if you have a problem, you can complain to them. Like there's someone who accountable. So I would suggest going there. I mean, does anyone else have any other ideas? Like Deborah, how was yours done? Oh, I think we lost Deborah. Yeah, Reedsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y. Um, and their blog is very good. If you're thinking about indie publishing or if you're writing a book, it, they have really good stuff. There's another guy, Dave Chesson. Um, he's Kindlepreneur. He has really good stuff. But again, it gets really confusing because it's just it, like Kindlepreneur guy writes like 50 articles a day and it just gets overwhelming. So Eileen, I'm sorry I can't answer your question more, but I would start with Reedsy. If you're looking right now, uh, I'll let you know if I come across anything um, in all the research okay. I'm doing. Okay, thanks. Okay. That's I, I I figured, and I mean I've I've gotten a few tips from folks in the writers' room about securing good editors, and in fact, some of the members of the writers' room are editors themselves. So we've got a nice little inside track on professional editing services. So I feel like when when I'm ready, I, I can, you know, I have a few options for finding an editor, but I just, I really do love this cover art. I mean, it's it's fabulous. So I'll oh, tell her that. Deborah, maybe she could tell us, good. Deborah just said her publisher has a designer. So she lucked out. Oh, like yeah. I lucked out. You can also um, hire Diane's friend too. Well, I don't know. And I don't think she'd be, she's a event designer. She's not a, she would consider it. If anyone is doing a book, she would consider it. I don't think she'd be cheap, but it's, she's like, I don't want to be a book cover designer. I'm like, for me, you are. <laughs> uh, Stacy. Hey there. So this is so informative. I mean, you're just sharing a lot of information that that I need um, because I've finished my manuscript and, and I'm in the process of um, looking for an editor. So that's my first question. I missed the sessions, I think, about the um, members of this group who are editors. I'm just putting it out there, not only for you, Diane, but I do need a um, an editor. So if anyone wants to share that information with me, that would be helpful. Maybe on um, Revel's, uh, uh, you know, uh, chat. Stacy, Stacy, Talani, yes. Talani, who's being very quiet tonight, just gave a link for you to go to. Thanks, Talani. Because because I'm already worried Tulani, about that. You always come through for me. You always <laughs> do. I tell you, I, I, I so appreciate it. But Diane, back to you. You had mentioned that, um, of course, that this book, this uh, is based on your life experiences loosely, right? But it's there. And you had mentioned that you're in the process or that rather that you put a, uh, another fictional work that you are working on, right? On the back burner. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Does that work, although it's on the back burner, is it a part two to this book? 
to your debut novel? And it's to not. what extent is that book based on your life experiences as well? So this next fiction book, I'm, I think, 57,000 words in. So I'm considering the first draft done. I'm on the first rewrite. Um, with Rock Oz, it took four rewrites and four and a half years for my that voice to come out that's in there. I don't know if I still write that way. We'll see. But the second book is a little more macro. So the second book is basically social commentary on people who are starting to search inward for their meaning mm. and for higher conscious spirituality and the Jeff Bezos of the world who want to keep people materialistic. So the story is about a corporate billionaire gets technology to zap spirits out of the sky. And that's because they want to keep people longing for material goods. And it's one, it's, it's the similar in the sense it's one woman's mm -hmm. quest. It's, it's getting the spirit back to where she belongs. And it's the woman who's lost everything who goes with her. It's her journey. So it's sort of me now. And I don't care what people say. Like, I think we all write about ourselves to one degree or another. So it's similar in some things to rock gods, but it's bigger. It's about life and spirituality and quantum physics and quantum mm -hmm. entanglement. So some would have been extension or a sequel to this, to this first book in some ways. I have to be, I have to say, I've recently woken up and been like, should I make the character Alex 20 years later? I don't know. I don't know. And my, I don't know. Yeah. That'll be rewrite three or four. Like when I do rewrites, it's not an edit. It's like a complete rip the whole book apart. It changes completely. So we'll see. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Catherine? Mm -hmm. um, what about audiobooks? Now that you have the print book out, I assume you have to, to make a print version happen before you can consider making an audiobook, right? And if you're playing an audiobook version, what are some things? things about producing an audiobook version that most writers aren't aware of well to do a decent one is six thousand dollars minimum so uh -huh. i'm not i'm uh -huh. waiting to see how the book does in print as you all heard me read i'm still too nervous i talk too fast i'm not quite there so if my goal is on my sub stack i'm going to start doing like youtube videos and i'm going to read scenes and then oh, I'll go idea. through the whole book that way. And then I might just piece them all together. Like then hire someone just to piece the audio together if they can equalize or. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling whatever I do will be DIY and on the punk side. Just I can't justify six to $10,000 on an audio book, mm -hmm. you know? So that's the thing about, you know, I think there are people who do it themselves. But if you've ever listened to a really bad podcast, it's really hard to get through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I think I also am toying with I'm probably going to start video shorts just on this whole process of promoting it too emotional while I was like putting the book together because that's I'm telling you so much went wrong um but to just sort of chronicle it as a diary for other people and not like as a influence from selling stuff but more like a personal diary journey through this process of people in the future it might help them and then I'm from that, I can sort of take out pieces. So anyway, audio is a dream. I'm using a professional microphone for the first time, you know, so we'll see. I Great. just want to say, I mean, Risha, can, are you able to share who you use for audio? So my friend Risha ended up using somebody to, to uh, record her book. Who was that? Hi. It's here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear Hi. You. Okay, um, I I can give you his name. Um, it, it's so strange how things happen, isn't it? What happened to me was I was just where you are, Diane, freaking out over the huge prizes. Oh my God. And I have a scaggly voice and maybe I could disguise it. Or, and into my inbox, comes a guy who says he will do an audiobook of any length 
for five hundred dollars. No, I never heard of this guy. I vaguely knew, you know, how there's always a chain of how somebody finds you. I vaguely knew somebody on that chain, and I said, and my book is a hundred fifteen thousand words long, so it's real. It's four hundred pages. I I did it. It was so strange. It felt so fly by night. I had to send him $500 via PayPal with knowing nothing. Well, it took a month. He said he would do it in five business days, but they got it done and they did a great job. But I don't think, A, he would be happy to hear from me again because it was such a bigger job than he expected. Um, but I can certainly give you its name. But what I'm really going to give you is listen for the opportunities. You know, the world we live in now is like the Wild West. Everybody's with their pickaxes looking for gold and um, they'll come they'll but, can, but can i ask you because i've had scammers emailing me how did you what was it about yeah. him how did you trust him because i would just have been like oh, oh no scam. good question good question i did i googled him mm. i googled him like mad and i found he was legit he and his wife had actually done something like 250 audiobooks for Audible. And I think they were trying to start their own business, you know, and they got some bad business advice when they put this offer out. I'm sure when they, they thought the average book was two hours long, mine is eight hours. Oh, and it turns out oh. that's pretty typical. There are lots of them along. So I don't think this particular duo is going to want to hear from me or anybody I know. They probably way raised their prices. But I bet there are many other people. And, and check them to out. To share their information just in case. Because you were okay. happy to call it. You were happy with the quality, so why don't you share their information? And the, just guy's, the guy's name is Robert Plank. And I'm not, I'll give you the two possible spellings. P-L-A-N-C-K or P-L-A-N-K, like the yoga pose. Thank you. Um, Nancy? I see your comment here. Do you own the rights and the ISBN to your book? Can you get away from that publisher? Because they're basically making you do everything it sounds from what you wrote in the chat. Yeah, they are making me do everything. I mean, they basically don't use even small press distribution anymore. They don't use Ingram. They don't use any of these places. They don't use Amazon. They know nothing about bookshop.org. <gasps> Ingram's, um, Ingram's not small press. Every large publisher goes to Ingram. Everyone goes to Ingram. So yeah, I mean, they are really small. So I don't want to, and, and they've been, you know, they gave me a prize, um, but it gets eaten up in buying author copies, but they're sending out 25 review copies. But I'm just like lost because I was so upset the night I found out they don't, they don't use Amazon. <laughs> I, so, you know, what so do I, I do? So first thing I want to say is get in touch with me anytime because like once a day I'm crying over something that went wrong. So you're not yeah, alone. There's been a lot of crying. Yeah. yeah. You're <laughs> not alone in this. Secondly, if you own your ISBN, and you have the IP and the rights still, like if you signed a contract, see what you own because you need to get away from them. They sound like a scammy hybrid publisher. You know, they're not really scammy. They've been around for a long time. They're just really small and they really suffered during COVID. They've published a couple of good writers before and they've got given them the prize that I got. So I, I don't really, it's just that because of 
of basically being really not having any money. They feel like Amazon is too expensive. They have to give it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything. I publish it on Amazon. It costs nothing. And it's print on well, that's demand. publishing it there. But I mean, in terms of Mark, you know, putting it up there, they no, you, that's, that's where the cost is. I no think. cost, no cost. It goes online. Now marketing it, if you're going to do ads, you're going to do all the promotions like BookBub, that was $280. I don't know if I'll get the money back, but it's, no, zero. But I, it's I zero. I was told that, I mean, when I looked at like what it means to post something on Amazon, have your book there, the two choices are 99 cents per sale and basically $40 a month. Nope. You make up your own price, 99 cents. Some people do for eBooks, but I, I just did it all. I set up a KDP account. I just uploaded my manuscript. I mean, you it has to get approved and whatever, but it's print on demand. So there's no charge. Now, Amazon takes a cut, but with Amazon, you're getting a 60% royalty rate. The problem is, is if you're going through this company and they are not putting, you're putting your own book on Amazon, you're still with this company, they're going to take a royalty for doing nothing. And I think it's great. They're nice. And they had, Look, my whole life got destroyed during COVID. Like that's why I, I commit, I've jumped into full-time writing. So I'm not trying to sound all like, like do it this way, but it, it, it irritates me because so many people get, I, I don't want to say you're getting ripped off, get bad deals or like to get in these situations. I've read a lot and I've watched a lot of videos of people who this type of thing has happened. So, and there's so much misinformation out there. You can set up a KDP account for free. You can upload your manuscript for free and you can sell it for free. They'll take a cut of what you sell. And yeah, was, I, yeah they, I certainly wouldn't mind them taking a cut. My concern is simply that I, I, and I own the rights. They have like one-time publication rights, but they are the publishers and, and they, did the design and they're producing the book initially. So I, um, I would maybe, like- Maybe, you know, Nancy, maybe we could talk offline because I don't think everybody- I'm sorry, I apologize. No, 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 it's fine. But I know where you are and I know the tears well, and I know the frustration. So yeah, yeah definitely. Sorry. And then Joyce, did you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to say, um, I'm going to go to Amazon. I wrote two novels, and but my biggest hurdle is the uh, editing and the book cover. But um, Amazon, when I looked it up, they give you a tutorial that's so easy to follow. Yeah. There, you can't really make a mistake. I mean, they actually have a tutorial, which I didn't realize, and that you can read it before you even attempt to go on it. And they tell you exactly what to do. And really Amazon is the only way to go since it's a major publisher. Well, I would highly suggest you do Amazon, but do not do expanded distribution because your royalty rate goes down to 35%. Do Amazon just for Amazon. Go to Ingram Spark. Ingram Spark is not as difficult as you'll see all these videos of people talking about how horrible it is. It's not that hard to do. There are videos on YouTube that like are videos of people walking you through the entire upload process. The, the biggest challenge on Ingram is they want a PDF 2100 X4, whatever. And my cover designer did all that. So I'm very fortunate that I had that. So that's, but there are videos on, you know, I highly recommend do it that way because otherwise you just, the royalty rate sucks. And that's not, like if you do expanded distribution globally, even your Amazon sales are 35%, not 60%. Oh, that's good to know. Um, could somebody write that down so that I could copy that? Yeah, because, um, well, I'm not anywhere near quite yet doing that, maybe in a few months, but um, I just know that it seems so simple to download everything and to get it done. Um, and they do offer, don't they? Um, well, you're um, marketing and all that too, but you have to pay for it. And yeah. what about, doesn't Goodreads though um, automatically come with Amazon? Goodreads and what about Book Baby? Good, so Goodreads is owned by Amazon, but they're separate. So yeah. the reviews on Goodreads don't go on Amazon. Now I'm just getting on Goodreads and what it, it looks like to me, it's all like 14 year olds, like people live on that thing. So I'm still figuring it out. I'm trying to find my tribe. I just started following a bunch of authors. Um, Book Baby is like Lulu. So Book Baby, I would say don't do, just do Amazon and do Ingram 
forget the book babies, oh, okay. the Lulus, okay. and all of them. It's okay. book bub. Book bub is what you want to look at to try to get a featured deal. The thing about book bub is if you get accepted for a featured deal, and let's say you do romance or women's fiction, you could pay four thousand dollars to run wow. a featured deal, which I'm in humor, which thank God is cheap, you know, so you have to weigh all that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nancy understands all this. Yeah. You know, it's, I didn't realize um, it's, uh, it's really mind boggling and it can make you really depressed. <laughs> <I'm sure>. Joyce, <laughs> Joyce, join Nancy and I just join Nancy. We'll all cry together. Cause yes, I've had days where I, I walk on a trail and I'm just walking down the trail crying like, what am I doing? And it's fine. Everyone goes through this. Talani. Thank you. Well, I Thank just wanted to, I wanted to more remark than anything else. I think that the horrors that you lived through in the music business were the perfect primer for the horrors that you're living through in, <laughs> in the writing and publishing business. But you and know I, what? It's my label now. Exactly. And I think yeah. that's probably, and you said it's punk rock, but I think it's, it really is that kind of pioneering entrepreneurial spirit that keeps you from killing yourself. And I'm not yeah. being facetious and I'm not underplaying it because fellow <laughs> music industry survivors still in it. Sometimes you're like, I should just jump off the top of the Capitol building because it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> but it's like you built all the calluses, you know that you could survive it. And then here you are now. And even though it doesn't seem successful on the inside, on the outside, it looks super sexy. Like you're definitely faking it till you make it kind of thing. Congratulations. Thank I'm really you. impressed by you. Thank um, you. I also, I do want to throw out, I, and, and I don't want to go woe is me. I mean, I've shed a lot of tears. I'm being very open about it. I also think that we should shed the tears because it is frustrating. We're learning something new. We're over 40 or 50. I'm going to be 61 in a week or two. You know what I mean? So like, it's not, I don't want to say it's a bad thing. It's a frustrating thing. So I'm laughing at myself while I'm crying, which I didn't do in the music industry. I took everything so seriously. I just think it's, I think it's beautiful. And I think that you've done something really, really remarkable here. And that you're doing your second book on how you did this is just a genius. <laughs> but you know what? And that's how I'm dealing with it too. It's like, I don't want anyone to go through this. And that's makes me feel good. Like it, it warms me that I might be able to help another person. And then the next book, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm sell it for billions of dollars. I'm just gonna go off all out. No, I'm joking. We're going to option it. We're going to pick the soundtrack. I'm going to be your music supervisor. No of course kidding. you are. <laughs> Talani, I'm already going to try to option this book. I don't care. What have I got to lose? You know? Absolutely. Well, yeah. that's the other thing though, is like you get to a certain point where you're like, why the hell not? Right. The worst thing you're going to do is tell me now. Right. And I would say for all of you, I mean, I'm assuming all of you are writers. I mean, congratulate yourself every day, you know, look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself what a great amazing supernatural human being you are because this can be a really tough thing to do and the fact that we're all doing it is amazing and I think because like like I see books all the time and I'm reading I'm like everybody's writing a book why am I writing a book who am I to write a book but if you get out in the real world like the girl who lived behind me in Meadowood in Newark Delaware where I grew up messaged me on Facebook and she bought a book, but she wanted me to autograph it. So I sent her one of my copies because she was so excited to know someone who wrote a book. You all have those people in your life. And just don't forget that. Laurel, do you still have a question or is your hand still just up? No, I think oh, I didn't realize I was supposed to lower it, but it's just fascinating and I'm really looking forward to reading your book it, it sounds you. like you've taken every cliche and turned it it's on its head and you know brought it somewhere from outer space to view in, in a multi-dimensional way <laughs> wow I might use that <laughs> well yeah. I've been trying to give you some of my Best commentary here. I really appreciate it having had such a similar background to you. I mean, many of the things you're saying I could be my life too, you know, and it, it's, it's real and yet it's surreal at the same time if you can capture both of those elements. 
yay for you. And it sounds as if you very well have and are continuing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important is that each writer write until they hear the symphony of the writing. We all have different styles. We're all different people. My book is not everyone's cup of tea, but it took years before that voice came out. We all have a very unique voice that people want to hear. So you just have to keep at it. And I know that's cliche, but it's true. And look, I'm getting guilty because I'm spending so much time promoting this darn thing. I got to get back to like working on a book. You know, people ask me like, why do you write? And I'm like, well, I write because I have to write. Like, like we have to breathe. I believe a writer has to write. And even if it's blog articles, you know, two line poetry, it's still writing. And it, it, you get that, that, that creative sati satiation that it's, it's living your dream, isn't it? Yes. It's living your dream. Yes. Even those small things, those are part of the dream. Yep. What did you say? The delusional dream, <laughs> <laughs> but you turned your delusional dream into, you know, your, your real dream. It always was your real dream. Well, and you're living it in a different way. And, and that still incorporates every bit of what you experienced. Yeah, the in funny, your old life. Well, the funny, the funny thing in the book is that about two years ago, I followed in Alex, the main character's footsteps. So the book has come to be true for me, which I think is sort of beautiful. But Risha, do you, do you have a question or comment? Oh, yes. Let me. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Oh, great. Um, if I might, I'm just meeting you for the first time, and it's a delight. Um, and, and I'm just learning about you for the first time. So I didn't hear, but once, the wonderful opening line. And I'm wondering if I could hear it again. And then... I think I heard you say it was four and a half years. Five and a half three, total. Five and a half. I would like to hear if you remember just the saga of, of the first line. I think that's remarkable. Wow. Um, so the first line is the blood didn't bother Alex, but cleaning it up made her angry. It's and that great. sets the tone for the whole book. So there came a point where I befriended my characters enough that they took over the story. So that is hard to explain, but I think a lot of writers experience that. Um, I know that, you know, and I feel guilty sometimes, like people get these spreadsheets and they have like, and I've tried to do it in these, like, you know, develop your character. I feel the characters and I... Adele said this when Oprah was interviewing her. She said, I don't know where the music, like, I don't know where my songs come from. They come from something bigger. The book wrote through me. It wasn't me. So that opening line, that was years of throwing things across the room. I mean, what I actually found the hardest, I had one scene, I know you guys are going to think this is silly, but there was a refrigerator and a penguin popped out and he waddles across the room and it's just like a Easter egg, like thrown in. And I loved it, but it did nothing for the book. So I had to cut it out. That was like the hardest thing is those little pieces that you love and you're like, ah, oh, it doesn't go anywhere. So what I do now is I cut it and I stick it in a folder and save it. Um, I will say I did not write that line. That line wrote itself because that's all I can say. Good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. We're starting to wind down here. So, um... yeah, can I ask Catherine, are you doing an audiobook or are you just curious? No, I I asked about that because audiobooks are my most favorite form to, for oh. reading fiction and nonfiction. And um, the corollary question I had is that because I've noticed that the, at least at the library, there are longer waiting lists often for the audiobook. Is is consumption of the what, what formats are most highly consumed? Is it still the printed version, and then the big print, and then ebook, and then audiobook? Do you know? 
I don't know. What I do know is that 43% of all books in 2020 were independently published. So that would be higher. So that wow. goes to my, we should all indie uh-huh. publish. Yeah. And that's 2020. So with the pandemic, it's a lot more. more. I don't know. Do you know, Kit? Does anyone? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I know audiobooks are very popular. It's on my list. One thing I do know is when you publish a book, they say do hardcover if you're doing print on demand, because with the algorithm and stuff at Amazon, they like more format. So if you have hardcover paperback, ebook, and audio, it's going to bump you up better in the algorithms. So unfortunately, I can't uh-huh. answer your other questions. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Thanks. This has been great. This has been such a seminar on how to publish. And, and it's such a great book that, I mean, as reading it, it reminded me of all the, the bad experiences I've had. I mean, the one job I had where I was, I was an independent consultant and my contract was up. So I went to the, the manager and I said, oh, you know, my, my contract's up today. And she yelled at me. She said, you should have told me a week, you know, two weeks ago that your contract was going up. And I just said, okay, well then I guess it's over. And I walked out. And it oh, was- I wish I was like you, Kit. I tortured myself, but I got a book out of it. So who wins in the end? So I have All no- you people from the music business. Uh, Stacy, did you, I think we're wrapping up soon, but there's Stacy and Eileen. And then do you want to close it out, Kit, after that? Yeah. So you might've touched on this, Diane, but if you were to, what is the most important lesson, the biggest takeaway for you from this whole process? I think for me right now is I didn't think anyone cared. I, I'm going to get emotional. Um, mm. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of support with my writing. I've wanted to be a writer since I was 15 and I come from a place where like you're mocked and you work in a corporation and you die and then you, you know, hopefully have a 401k. I don't know. But since I started this process, it was my friend Cree who did the book cover. Like she initiated all this. Her support has been undeniable. And then the writer's room, like you guys, I'm not used to getting positive feedback. So the what I've gotten out of this is that people do care. And I know that might sound so minimal, but that's so huge for me. Mm-hmm. I'll put that in my next book. I'll have a yes. character that just cries all the time. And thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you. No, thank you, Stacey. Eileen? Um, earlier, someone mentioned, Kid, it might have been you, that this would be a great book for a book club uh, selection. And honestly, I, I would participate. So, <clears throat> you know, just to think about in the next couple of days, maybe set up a, a, you know, a book club for emerging writers. And, you know, we can do a discussion of the book. It could be an event in and of itself. I do participate in several of the Revel book clubs. They have so many. So, you know, pick a day and time that works for, for you and, and you can be, the author can make an appearance at a new book club for emerging writers on Revel. So Eileen, I would love that. Um, I actually, in your copy in the back, there's discussion questions for a book yep. club. And I have a book club kit that's not completely finished, but that's on the website. So I have a whole kit that people are going to be able to download, but maybe you guys could be my betas and help me sort of, because because one another thing is libraries are really good places when you guys publish your books. Um, I didn't know this, but libraries have, you sell a bag full of books they'll order it from you and like discussion questions and material you put a folder in and then libraries will buy them and then they rent them out to people who have local book clubs and it's a great way to sell 10 or 12 or 15 books at one time so i started putting it together and it just it's on a back burner so yeah i'd love to pursue it if you're open to it and you could give me some advice 
Eileen, you should host the event. I, I was just going to say, Kit, I'll, I'll pick your brains for advice and maybe the three of us can chat further, you know, in, in a in a breakout room at, during the writer room um, later this week. But, you know, I think it would be good. We have a few people in the writer's room who have published books for whom this might be um, a great boon for them as individuals, as writers, for their careers, but also good for everyone else who's in their process to get a better idea of everyone else's process. So, all I mean, it, it's a win-win, you know, a win-win-win. Yes. And Eileen, it's book four, how to do a book club. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, Karen, you know what? I just Googled it. I'm not an expert on it yet. So um, if you just, Karen asked about finding out more about book kits for book clubs. I just came across articles that, that a lot of libraries buy these book club kits from authors. So you'll have to join. So Karen, you're going to have to join our little book club thing and you're going to learn. We're going to learn together how to do this. So I just want to say before Kit does wrap up, I just want to thank you guys really from the bottom of my heart. This means more than you know that you all showed up and listened. Thank you. Thank you for giving information. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's all been very enlivening. Thanks, Laurel. Yeah. Hey, Laurel, it's Sadie. I'm here. Hey, Sadie. I wish I could see everybody, but I'm so glad to hear all of you. Well, thank you all for coming and thank Diane. This was a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Diane. And thanks for hosting, Kit. Right. Yep, thank you, Kit. I love I Look forward thank to the Emerging Writers Book Club, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everybody.